Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to uh, this afternoon's uh, webinar. Um, very happy to see so many people here already uh, and hoping to see more uh, join the call as, as we uh, go along. Um, so to start off today, uh, my name is Yanda Stierman, and I'm a policy manager at j Africa, working on the labor market and crime and violence sectors in our policy team. Um, whether you are joining us uh, for a panel discussion for the first time today, or you're a returning guest, welcome. Um, for a bit of background and context setting, let me start off by saying that j Africa is based at the University of Cape Town and located in the School of Economics under the South African Labor and Development Research Unit, or SALJU. Uh, j Africa conducts randomized evaluations, builds partnership for evidence-informed policymaking, and helps partners scale up effective programs. As you will hear today, during the discussion, our research team evaluates the impact of social programs and policies in South Africa, covering a wide range of sectors, including labor markets, urban services, and political participation. Our policy team, including me, works with organizations and governments across Africa to build, pilot, and scale up effective interventions. And lastly, our training team builds researcher capacity to conduct randomized evaluations and policymaker capacity to use evidence from randomized evaluations effectively. So before we dive into the uh, substance of our, of our discussion today with our three wonderful panelists, I just need to make a few logistical announcements to keep the flow of the conversation going. So firstly, today's panel discussion will be uh, recorded and made available early next year, and shorter clips of some of the key points made today will be disseminated on our social media channels, primarily our Twitter uh, feed. You should follow us on Twitter, uh, if you're on Twitter, at, uh, at jpal underscore Africa. Secondly, there'll be a 20-minute Q&A discussion in the second half of the program today. So if you have specific questions you would like to ask our panelists, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. And please indicate if you would like the question to be asked anonymously. Uh, lastly, please direct your question to a specific panelist or indicate if you would like all of them to give a quick response. Okay, so with that out of the way, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our three panelists, after which each of them will have a few minutes to share their research and insights. And I will ask a few questions to prime the Q&A part of our uh, discussion today. All right, so our first panelist today is Kate Orkin, who is a faculty member in economics and uh, public policy at the Blackfinick School of Government at the University of Oxford. And she is a member of the research team at the Center for Study, um, sorry, at the Center for Study of African Economies. She works in labor, behavioral and development economics in East and South Africa. She designs and tests interventions which aim to increase employment, earnings and productivity. Examples include cash transfers to facilitate entry into higher return uh, self-employment, improving the information employers have about worker skills or improving uh, processes of matching between firms and workers. Our second panelist today is Rulof Berger, who is a professor in economics at Stellenbosch University. Rulof conducts much of his work in South Africa and his research is, fo is focused primarily on applying microeconomic uh, techniques to answer South African labor market questions. Rulof received his PhD in economics from the University of Oxford. And our final panelist today is Nilmini Heroff. Uh, she is an economics candidate, a PhD in economics candidate at the London School of Economics and Political Science. As a previous research manager at j Africa, Nilmini headed the research team um, and oversaw the implementation of randomized evaluations across South Africa. Uh, she also built new research partnerships and projects and sharing the lessons of our research with policymakers. She now partners with j Africa and other researchers to study the impact of different work experience features on young South Africans. So for this first part of our discussion, I'll hand over to uh, Kate for a presentation and then on to Rulof and then over to Nilmini. Uh, thereafter, we'll start the discussions. So Kate, take it away. Um, great, can everybody see the, um, the slides? Yeah. Rulof and Nilmini, could you nod if you can see the slides? Yeah, great. Um, hi, everyone. Sorry not to have video on. I'm, um, I'm on a holiday, but um, uh, I'm the only person on this, this time zone who was able to speak. So 
I'm very glad to be here today and celebrating um, this momentous occasion with j -Pop. We've been in very early days um, doing <laughs> camping out in coffee shops before we even had a, an office in Joburg. So it's really great to see the institution growing and developing and with it um, some very exciting labor markets research in South Africa. So I'm just going to talk about a, a paper that um, was put together um, so beginning in 2014. Um, with the collaboration of the, the JPOL Africa office. Um, and so this is this is done with, uh, it was a broad consortium with a number of different partners. Um, so Eliana Carranza bringing in the um, World Bank and the Gender Innovation Lab and the a jobs um, group at the World Bank, Rob Garlick at Duke, um, and then Neil Rankin, who um, at that time was at Stellenbosch, but work, was working a lot with the implementing partner, the Harambi um, Youth uh, Employment Accelerator. So a really broad team effort to put this trial together. The motivation for the trial is that in many African countries, um, young people don't have what we call good signals of their, their skills. So you can see on um, this <laughs> on, in the picture, you know, this is a, a labor market for construction where people do have pretty good signals of their skills um, in that they, they are able to say, you know, that this is what, uh, the, you know, what they're able to do. But in, mark, in labor markets for things like simple sales and service and retail, it's much more difficult for firms to know from a worker's matric certificate what they're going to be able to do in the workplace. And especially given the um, given labor market regulation in South Africa, the idea that you wouldn't know uh, the sort of worker that you were getting can make hiring much more risky for firms. We have a lot of theories suggesting that in these contexts, um, you know, if, if hiring is more risky, this would predict that firms may lower their wage offers and hire people less. And um, so we, you know, we know that uh, if this limited information problem exists, this might have pretty dire implications for employment. But until recent, you know, until recent work, ours, uh, uh, Ruloff and teams and others, we didn't actually know um, the extent to which this occurred in practice. Another thing that's interesting in this paper that we look at is, um, you know, a lot of the time people have assumed that the only people who lack information are firms. Um, that they, you know, workers know what they're good at, and it's just firms who struggle to to um, learn from workers uh, what they're good at because the firms don't have signals of skills. But in this project, we also explored the idea that in the South African context, work seekers might actually not know the sorts of jobs that they're suited for, and in this case, if they're targeting jobs that don't suit their skills, they may take longer to find jobs, incur higher search costs, or end up in jobs where they're not a really good fit, and so they end up earning less than they could. And so in this project, we were exploring um, whether this problem of limited information is faced by both firms and, and work seekers. So what we did was uh, designed a signaling intervention. This was co-developed in partnership with um, you know, a lot of focus groups with work seekers, speaking to firms, um, working a lot with the Harambi Youth Employment Accelerator, who are a really innovative social enterprise who partner with government and business to try and develop a range of evidence-based interventions that can improve the extent to which young people can find jobs. Um, so we, we worked with this whole uh, sort of group of people and put together this intervention, uh, which we call a signaling intervention. You can see it on the on the screen there. Um, so it's basically a, a certificate. It's a report on candidates' competencies. So what Harambi was doing at the time was a set of standardized skills assessments that um, you know, were a range of, of uh, different assessments that were on workplace related skills that many of many firms were using already in hiring. And so Harambi would uh, do a lot of advertising to different um, unemployed young people, both on social media, on normal media and sort of feet on the street campaigns. And they had a large number of work seekers coming through the organization and um, sitting these standardized skills assessments. So the thing that we added on top to what they were doing was that we gave work seekers, um, first of all, the information on how they'd done on the assessments that they'd set. So we gave them some counseling about how to use this information to decide how to apply for jobs. And then we also gave them a stack of, of reports that they could uh, use to give to firms. And here you'll see, you know, the, the reports had some information about the this, this different skills that work seekers had been assessed on. And then they also had information on where the work seekers were in the distribution. So on each of the skills, were they in the top, middle or, or bottom third? And work seekers were usually good and bad at some of the skills. We had a range of different skills, some uh, more traditional hard skills like numeracy and communication and some softer skills as well. 
So we did a randomized trial. Um, there's a lot of different arms that I won't talk about today, but the basic one was that we assigned work seekers either to get this intervention or to get the con uh, a control where they still sat the tests, but they didn't get the counseling or the reports. So then we follow them up by phone, uh, three to five months, and we follow up these, these two groups of people. And here's the results in a, in a nutshell, the papers currently um, revise and resubmit. Um, so uh, I'll put the link to it in the, the chat afterwards, but um, this fairly uh, low cost intervention has, has after three to five months, um, some pretty exciting effects on um, employment and earnings. And you'll see that these line up, I think with work that Rulof's about to present. Um, so really suggesting that improving the level of information available uh, to both work seekers and firms improves the, the work seekers labor market outcomes. So there's a 17% increase in, in um, employment um, after three to five months, whether people worked in the last week. This is mostly higher uh, in, in wage employment rather than self-employment. Um, and it's, uh, people are also more likely to have a formal job. So increases in earnings of 34%, which mainly comes from, from higher wages. So those who work don't end up working more hours. Um, and uh, then we, we also see an, an increase um, there in, on, in the third bar in, in hourly wages. And then in total, people are working more hours, but that's largely because um, they're employed. So because there are more people who are employed. Um, the intervention also has larger effects if people are less educated or they have less work experience. Um, the effects are similar for lower and higher performers on the tests and for women and men. Um, and we also looked at doing counseling on its own. That has some effects, but they're smaller than the effects of work seekers being able to give the information to firms. We also did a detailed costing with the NGO, um, and we find that the intervention delivers about $130 uh, in earnings gains um, over the first three months after the intervention. So it more than pays for um, what it, it uh, costs to implement, in fact, by, by many times. Um, so it's a, a fairly uh, cost-effective intervention to, to implement. And then finally, we've been doing quite a lot of work to um, try and get this intervention scaled up. So partnering with uh, JPAL and with Harambi, um, we've been doing some work on um, uh, piloting different versions of the intervention. And um, this is uh, showing piloting in Rwanda, um, where uh, we adapted the report for, for use there. We also did a detailed costing. Uh, we developed a, a toolkit for practitioners, which is a kind of uh, describes in detail the practical details um, of how one would implement this intervention. And then we've been working with various government partners to try and get these sorts intervention so about both our work and then other work that's been done in the South African context by other researchers um, included in, in government strategies so we've been working quite a bit with the, the city of Cape Town um, and then also work advising the presidency on, on design of post-COVID um, active labour market um, policies and then the intervention has also been picked up outside South Africa um, so both in Gambia and in, in Kenya currently but we're getting more and more um, examples of, of where it's uh, this sort of work is being used and um, so yeah it's been a, a really exciting partnership and we're doing quite a bit of work um, continuing with uh, Harambi and with JPAL um, developing more interventions in this, this space. Great thank you so much for that uh, presentation Kate. Um, I'm sure there are going to be quite a few uh, questions asked of you after this so uh, let's move on right ahead to uh, Rulof. Uh, thanks, Yana. Can you see my screen? Okay, great. Uh, so, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rob Berger, and I'm going to tell you about some work that I did along with, with Martin Obel, Eliana Carranza, and Patricia Pereno, uh, and in which we partnered with JPL Africa and the Department of Employment and Labor uh, to test using RCTs two interventions uh, aimed at, imp uh, at, at uh, improving the labor market prospects of young South African job seekers. So, so the background to the study is, is simple. We know that South African unemployment is very high. We know that uh, the causes, uh, some of the causes of unemployment are structural and they're going to be expensive and slow to, to change. Uh, so the question that we posed here was, uh, whether there are any inexpensive ways to quickly improve the employment prospects of a large group of young job seekers. Uh, so we decided to partner with the Department of Employment and Labor, largely because they already have these 700 labor centers scattered throughout the country that provide uh, many young job seekers with career counseling and job search assistance. 
Um, so we sat down with the department and we, we basically tried to find interventions that uh, could easily be implemented by the department uh, that would be inexpensive, that was, uh, uh, that we as researchers thought would be effective uh, and that the Department of, uh, of, of, of Employment and Labor were excited about. And, and based on these criteria, we settled on two interventions uh, using reference data templates and creating job search action plans. Uh, both of these interventions were then tested on registered job seekers at labor centers uh, using randomized control trials, uh, and they were implemented by the career counselors that already work at these, at these labor centers. Right, so let me start with the reference letters. Um, so the background is that job seekers often struggle to communicate their skills to employers. We know that employers also struggle to judge the skills of applicants. Um, and as a result, companies have increasingly relied on social network to, uh, networks to fill vacancies. Uh, and we know that this disadvantages those job seekers with weak social networks, but also females who often benefit uh, less from these social networks. Um, so, so through some focus group discussions with job seekers and with employers, we, we found that uh, very few job seekers were actually using reference data in this labor market that we're, that we're focusing on. Um, and then secondly, employers desperately wanted more reliable information about the skills of applicants and particularly the non-cognitive skills of applicants. Uh, so based on this feedback, we designed a reference data template that a, that, that a previous employer can easily complete. So this is what the reference data template would look like, right? So, so the career counselor at the labor center would make a couple of photocopies of this template and then give it to the young job seeker. And then me as the job seeker, I would take it to someone that I'd done some work for, uh, for in, the, in the past. And a crucial difference between this template and just asking someone to, to write a reference data is the employer doesn't need to go sit in front of their computer and type out a whole reference data. Uh, the employer can just grab a pen and, and fill in the, the necessary boxes uh, so it's much less onerous on the employer, and we think that that would make the job seekers more willing to, to approach their, their previous employers. Uh, and then it also prompts the employer to provide useful information. So, so they're asked to provide some general information about themselves, their contact information, which we think would make the reference data more, uh, more credible. And then they're also prompted to, to rate the candidate in, in terms of specific non-cognitive and cognitive skills. Right, so, so we did a couple of experiments using this reference data to test the effect of that. And through this, we learned firstly that, that between 30 and 40% of job seekers can successfully get uh, a completed reference data from a previous employer. Uh, secondly, so this is, we, we, we focused only on, on job seekers with at least some previous work experience. Uh, secondly, when, when we did an experiment in which we applied on behalf of the job seekers, and we, we randomly sometimes included this reference data and other times we didn't, we found that including the reference data increased the probability of an interview request by 60%, right? So that's a large increase for, for just for a piece of paper. Um, and, and furthermore, we found that uh, when we included the reference data, employers were able to more accurately identify applicants with stronger skills where we did some skills tests and applicants that wasn't revealed in the reference data. Um, so it seems like these reference letters contain useful information and help the, the employers in, in uh, selecting the, the, the candidates that's a good fit uh, for the vacancies that they're advertising. Uh, in a second experiment, we gave these reference letters to, to certain job seekers, but not to others. Uh, and, and when we checked back on them in three months, we found that uh, uh, at least amongst the women, uh, uh, those who, who, who use the reference later, um, uh, sorry, a woman, um, uh, sorry, let me start over again. Uh, amongst the people who, who receive the reference later, women were more likely to use the reference later and, uh, and it benefited women uh, who, who were in this treatment group, right? So after three months, the woman who had received the reference later template uh, were 50% more likely to be employed than women who were not in the reference data template. Again, that's a very large effect uh, for, for just a uh, piece of paper, especially if you consider that only about half of the women in the reference data group uh, actually uh, uh, reported that they'd used the reference data. Um, and the, the second intervention that we tested was this uh, these action planning prompts. So the background there is that uh, in our focus group discussions, we learned that many young job seekers uh, fail to submit as many job applications as they plan to. And our previous studies, mostly in health, have found that 
uh, careful action planning can be an effective tool in helping young people through uh, follow through on their plans. So the idea is if I sit down and write down the where, the when, and the how of my intention to get vaccinated or to get tested, uh, then I'm more likely to follow through on that intention than if I just have a vague plan to do it at some point in the future. So we decided to test this intervention uh, in the job search process. Um, so, so again, we, we did a randomized control trial where everyone in the control group just received the normal uh, career counseling that the labor centers offer, but then people in the treatment group are, who were randomly allocated also received this action planning template that you see in front of you, where they were prompted to sit down and just take a few minutes to write down uh, uh, the kind of job search activities that they were planning to engage in, right? Uh, they had to write down uh, when and where uh, and how they would 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 uh, would do these tasks. Uh, and then when we when we spoke to to everyone three months later, what we saw was that the 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 job applicants in the action planning uh, treatment group uh, had sent out 27 more applications than those in the control group. And they did so despite the fact that they had spent no more time on job search. And what seems to be happening, uh, what we see in the data, is that people who do these careful uh, action plans uh, tend to shift their, their, their efforts to, to, to uh, more effortful and more complex channels, like visiting an employment agency, dropping off CVs, uh, and uh, answering adverts, searching online, uh, and away from the easier search channels, like just calling up a family uh, family member or a friend and asking them uh, whether they know of any, any jobs. Uh, we also see that the, the people in the treatment group who did this action planning uh, were 46% uh, more likely to, or they received 46% more job offers, and they were 43% more likely to, to work uh, after three months. Right, so there's a lot more I can say about that, but uh, we can touch on that in the Q&A. Thank you, everyone. Great, thanks so much, Rulof. Um, and I, I, yeah, I, I again predict that we'll have uh, quite a few questions on, uh, like you said, the power of um, a piece of paper uh, in terms of uh, having an effect on employment outcomes. All right, uh, so we'll hand over to our last uh, panelist for today, Normani. Oh, you're still on mute, uh, Nilmini. Sorry about that. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Okay. All right. Great. Um, all right. So yeah, thank you. It's it's uh, really it's really lovely to be here um, and to uh, be able to sort of share the the insights I've gained from working in this environment. My my role's been a little different to um, uh, Kate's and Rulof's from uh, for much of my career in this area. So I've um, I spent a lot of time uh, working uh, actually on, on uh, partnering with them on their studies and, and others um, and being more on the ground in South Africa as the research manager of JPAL Africa. So speaking um, directly with unemployed youth, with youth in entry level jobs, with their managers, with their career counselors and with the many practitioners who run these kind of labor markets programs and more recently i've um, joined their club of trying to test um uh, formally test some solutions to this um myself with my colleagues but that's uh, at an earlier stage so i won't be um presenting uh results of interventions that have been tested today but nonetheless i think uh, after working in this space for so long i have i have learned a few things um and these are really the, th the main things i've learned so what one is that you know we've we've spoken a lot today about trying to get young people into work uh, into jobs maybe trying to get the right people into jobs through things like action planning and skill certification reference letters but um that's really not the end of the road for our work with with youth unemployment so we what what some of the you know um my work has shown is that the um young people sort of still continue to struggle when they're in a job as many misaligned expectations and um, things going on there, and so we need to figure out how to support young people in their in their entry level opportunities and make sure that they uh, get the best out of them. Um, another thing that I think has come through in the presentation so far, but again I want to emphasize, is that there are many different kinds of 
uh, unemployed young South Africans and they face different they face different barriers and um, are going to respond differently to the different kinds of programs that we're running and testing. So you've seen examples of that already and I'll speak a little bit more about that too. Um, and then finally, I uh, again, I think this is going to be kind of, this is probably feeling like a bit of a theme by now, but there's a real dearth of information on both the firm and youth side um, in this environment. And um, I've seen so many examples of youth accessing very poor information about how to navigate the labor market. Um, and, and really, I think that's that's a huge issue that, that needs to be addressed. So when I when I say that getting youth a job is not the end what I, what I mean by that is that you know even once youth are we, we we you know put a lot of effort into trying to get young people into jobs but once they're in jobs things don't always even once they're in jobs things don't always go so smoothly so on the employee side when we sort of speak to uh, when we've when we run surveys of young people in in um, uh, work experience programs or in entry-level jobs we see that young people's expectations often seem to be sort of misaligned with the realities of entry level work. And when I when I say they're misaligned, I mean they're very high. Um, they're very high expectations of uh, what this job's going to be like, what it's going to lead to for them, um, and um, it um, and you know that could possibly be sort of setting them up for certain types of sort of disappointment or or issues later on. And, and I think this kind of fits with what we also hear on the employer side as well. So many, um, when we ran a large survey of hiring managers last year, uh, we heard a uh, you know, story that will resonate with all of the, many of those of us who've hired um, young people in South Africa ourselves, that it's incredibly hard to find the right people for the job. It's, uh, it takes a really substantial time commitment and it often involves trying to kind of creatively uh, figure out what um, uh, things that can't be inferred from people's CVs, um, which things like, uh, you know, kind of Rulofs and Cates interventions definitely help with, um, but it's a, it's a real struggle um, in this labor market. And something that was very striking to us in, in the survey of hiring managers we ran last year is uh, employers reporting to us that it's really, it's, it's so much more important and difficult to find youth with the right attitude than with the right skills. Um, so there's something kind of very, you know, important uh, going on there that we that you know is is hard to signal. Um, that's not all bad news. The fact that things don't go smoothly in jobs because jo entry level work experience programs can be a good place for both employers and employees to maybe learn about these things. And then if we can find the right ways to support it, I think um, I think there's definitely lots of uh, you know potential for these things to to help, but it needs to be tested. And then um, my second point was that South African youth are not all the same. Um, and of course, we know that we have, we're all individuals, so we're, we're not all the same in general. Um, but what I really mean by this is that, you know, different youth face different levels of kind of barriers to uh, gaining and maintaining employment. And so they're going to respond differently to different programs. We see this. Um, we've seen this already in some of the examples Kate and Ruloff have given. So Kate said, as, as, as Kate's study, study showed, they had, you know, larger effects on people who were less educated and who had less work experience. Ruloff's um, reference letter study had different impacts based on gender. Um, and there are also some differences, I think, we're, we're, some of uh, our kind of more qualitative work we've been doing has revealed, I think, a few more differences in maybe some less tangible attributes too, or less easy to measure things. So my colleague Rocco always talks about meeting youth who have either a learning or an earning mindset, for example. Um, and and my, yeah, my, my, my personal view is that there's a lot to do with differences in different social networks and information people have. Um, and so we see these differences at every stage. We see that there are differences in who walks through the door for these programs. They're often, uh, for un the unemployment programs we test, they're often very heavily female. Um, uh, we, we see differences in who's selected for them by our partner, um, our partners in government and NGOs. And then we obviously see differences when we, when we test um, in who benefits the most from them. And, um, my last point I think kind of related is that, um, like I said, a bit of a theme by now, but there are uh, real issues in information here. It's an incredibly information poor environment, um, especially for both firms and youth, but, but especially for youth. And I, uh, what I've 
seen sort of through my work on the ground is a lot of um, young people really just struggling to navigate the labour market in every way, not knowing where to search for jobs, how to search for jobs, what the right jobs are for them, what to expect from a job, how to perform well once they're in a job. Um, and, and so I think, uh, you know, well, we have to start asking ourselves, you know, where does this information come from and what can we do to um, kind of enhance or, or supplant some of it. Um, so yeah, that's uh, you know it's not all bad news. It's uh, I think all these all these insights are also reasons for optimism, reasons for further research. There's lots of um, things that can be done about this. Lots of amazing people working on these programs um, in South Africa, and um, yeah, I think we're in a good place, having learned for having you know learned what we've learned already to uh, to go forward with our new generation of research and um, testing some of these things out. Great. So. Um, that's all from me, but thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Nilmini, for your presentation. I think it was a really great way to, um, to wrap up and to draw connections between your work and your um, experience, as well as that of uh, Rulofs and Kate's uh, in their studies as well. Um, so just to remind everyone uh, that if you would like to ask a question, feel free to uh, pop it in the chat or in the Q&A function um, uh, of, of this call. Um, I see Kate has answered a couple of <laughs> questions already, which is great um, in the chat, and we'll definitely have uh, more time for questions um, uh, in a few minutes when I uh, open up the discussion. Um, but just in terms of, uh, I guess, follow up or clarity uh, seeking questions, I just had a few uh, or one question to ask um, uh, to each panelist, um, to Kate. Uh, I think particularly around uh, your work and the, the reference you made to working uh, in Rwanda, Kenya, and the Gambia, um, you know, largely sort of speaking, can the research on the South African labor market uh, be replicated or adapted, uh, or sort of is it generalizable in other uh, African countries as well, such as the, one, uh, the ones that you have mentioned um, and others? Yeah, so it's, that's a really great question. Thank you to the, the person who raised it. I think that, um, you know, the, the South African labor market has some differences from uh, labor markets in the rest of Africa, as we as we all know. Um, you know, one of the big ones is the um, the sort of level of, of regulation. Um, so, you know, that the minimum wage actually binds in, in many places is, is, is sort of fairly well inspected and uh, people comply with it. Um, you know, so they, they, that is different. Um, it's also more difficult to to, to fire workers, I and mean, that's something that firms are very aware of when we when we speak to them. This is not to place any judgment on whether that's a good or a bad thing. You know, it is just the case empirically when you look at, um, for example, the World Bank has an index of kind of labor market regulation, and South Africa is is higher up on on that index than other African countries. Um, so I think you know the approach that we've taken is to have a model in the paper. It's quite a simple one. But it basically says, you know, what what sort of places would this, um, you know, what dimension should you look at to see if this this research is going to apply in, in other places? So the one thing that is important is the extent to which um, there's a minimum wage, a wage floor, um, because for our research, you know, if you're very uncertain as a firm about whether you should hire a worker, one of the things you can do is is lower the wage at which you hire the worker, and then you know maybe it it, uh, it doesn't have such big costs for you, even if the work isn't very good. But of course, if you have a minimum wage, you can't you can't do that. So the extent to which these information problems would have an effect on employment may vary a bit depending on whether or not there's a, a binding minimum wage in the context. So that's one thing. You know, the other the other factor we talk about is the extent to which the school leaving certificate actually gives good information and is, is recognized. Other countries in Africa, the school leaving certificate might actually be a bit better um, and people uh, you know, recognize it more. So that may be a factor. Um, the extent to which firms think hiring is risky may also be a factor. So we don't try and say this will definitely apply. We try and say, here's a, a theoretical framework that you can use when you're trying to apply this in other contexts that will help you think about the extent to which it's, it's gonna apply. Um, but there's also been great work done by um, colleagues in, in Ethiopia, um, so Girma Bebe and et al, and then uh, Vittorio, uh, so there's a paper by Basi and Nansamba in Uganda, finding sort of qualitatively similar findings from this, these sorts of interventions. So I think we do have some indication that um, they, they do work in, in other contexts as well. 
Great, thank you so much for that, Kate. Um, I think that was uh, really insightful. Um, and, and again, just you know, sort of speaking about the, the differences um, uh, as you highlighted in the in the South African labor market, and but what that means though for uh, for other countries and sort of how this uh, this knowledge or the research study uh, findings travel um, across sort of geographies. Okay, so the next question I'm going to ask is to uh, Rulof, um, and this question is about the application of uh, digital technologies. Um, these technologies have uh, resulted in the polarization of the labor market in developed countries, particularly the U.S. And so what, what is the experience uh, um, in South Africa, if you've uh, sort of looked at that or tested that in any way? Um, I, I have looked at that. So, so, um, so, so not using RCTs yet. We're, we're planning a, an RCT that's, that's uh, going to look at some opportunities that's offered by the digital technologies. But maybe I can just start by, by talking about what we think has already happened in South Africa. So um, internationally, we've seen this trend, uh, uh, this, what, what we call routine bias technical change, where, where people who do tasks that are routine intensive seem to be uh, these are, they're being replaced by machines uh, because the tasks are being automated. And internationally, that has produced this, uh, what, what, we, what we call a hollowing out of the, of the wage distribution. So, so these jobs are usually somewhere in the middle of the wage distribution and those jobs seem to be disappearing. Uh, some work that I did recently suggests that we're already seeing that, uh, although quite slowly so far in South Africa, uh, and it seems to be the case that the people in the middle of the wage distribution are, are moving up or down depending on, on some of their other attributes. So it seems to be something that, that's making uh, white and Indian males move up the wage distribution. So they seem to be benefiting from the, these technological changes, whereas black and colored workers and particularly females seem to be moving down, which is, which is exactly the, the opposite of what, what, what we'd like to see, right? Um, uh, and there's also some, some studies on uh, other low-income countries that suggest that females are particularly vulnerable uh, to, to automation because the kind of jobs that they do as a high routine task, even if you compare them to males in the same occupation with the same level of education, they tend to do more routine tasks and that makes them more vulnerable to automation. So, so uh, one study that, that I'm, I'm currently busy with uh, which is which is just about to launch as a pilot. Looks at some of the opportunities that are being presented by internet-based uh, work opportunities, right? So, so this these kind of jobs where you where you sit at home and on your phone you look at what the what the kind of tasks are that you can get paid for, and then you do these short stint uh, jobs or, or, or kind of gig opportunities, and and you get paid immediately. Um, and, and that's, you know, unfortunately, these aren't very stable uh, jobs, so that's, that's lamentable. But I think one of the reasons why that's really exciting is, um, is, is, is because, well, so, so one of the things that really worries me and I think a lot of other labor economists about, about youth unemployment in South Africa is the scarring effect, right? There are studies that show that if you're in your early 20s and you're not working, uh, that has a permanent negative effect on your productivity because you're missing out on the opportunity to, to build all of these good work habits when you're at your most malleable. And, and I think it'd be very interesting to see if, if uh, access to these gig opportunities perhaps can, can kind of ameliorate, ameliorate some of those scoring effects by, by helping people, at least in short stints, uh, be more work ready, be more confident, uh, acquire some of, those, some of those habits. So that's, that's something that we're busy setting up an experiment for and that we're, we're very excited about. Thank you. That's yeah, very thorough. Um, I think answer and and really sort of gets to I think the heart of uh, of that question um, that was posed by a, a participant. Um, so Nilmini, um, I have a two part question for you, um, and it's quite broad, but um, I think it's definitely one that um, that uh, you know you can answer. Um, I think quite knowledge knowledgeably. Um, essentially, the first part of the question is uh, you know asking about what can be done to support job creation within a very challenging economic context like that uh, of South Africa and the sort of during COVID uh, period. And the second part of that is, uh, you know, what you've learned so far about where the future uh, sort of major sources of labor demand uh, will come from, uh, particularly again in South Africa. Uh, could you just ask the last question again, please? Sure. Um, so this question is, what, what have you learned so far about where the future major sources of labor demand will come from in South Africa?
Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, so actually these are these are hard questions to answer. So the first is uh, what can be done to support job creation during a challenging economic context? So um, uh, I think, Many, I think, I think when we 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 run a we run a sort of COVID uh, COVID employment study last year, um, uh, surveying many for you know hiring managers in this, who you know at the height of the pandemic, to, figuring out kind of what what they were feeling and what the kind of things that came um, up through that work were that the all the kind of existing problems, all the things we've spoken about so far, um, are just made worse. Um, by the by the current context right they're just made these information issues these um uh, these problems that just that it, everything's just sort of squeezed um to be harsher so i think many of the same um things and sort of ideas and solutions we've discussed here um are still really valid and and crucial even even more important um i i suspect there are some other uh, there, are, I suspect there are some other things that should be should be done too. So there are, um, um, uh, I suppose, in the in the current context, things like uh, some some of the barriers young people face on the financial side might be might be a bit starker. Um, so maybe some of the sort of COVID grants and stuff are are more important too. Um, but um, the, yeah, many I. It probably just requires a really, really multi-pronged approach. Really understanding what the constraints are at the firms and what the constraints are at the young people at the uh, applicants' ends, and and trying to sort of figure out, um, try, you know, trying to just throw as much as you can at the problem, given given the um, severity, the current severity, um, and then future sources, future sources of labour demand in South Africa. Um, I I have worked a bit less on the demand side actually um but um uh i think i think something i feel uh i, th I think something that's useful in south africa is that we have these we we have these kind of partners like many of the ones we work with who work very closely with industry right so they run unemployment programs and they work with um they work with but they work you know with real companies so i you know i run research with yes and they work with real companies to create um work experience opportunities for uh, for young south africans and i know kate works with harambi really for the department of labor and all these groups kind of work with industry too and i think that's where i, th I suspect that's where the money is in south africa right like li well, quite literally but also in terms of um in, in terms of stimulating demand i think continuing to have um our um our youth employment program practitioners work with industry is gonna is gonna be what kind of helps um make sure we're sort of seeing those uh those the, those areas where demand is picking up um those sectors etc and, and and getting youth into those jobs Great, thank you so much uh, for those insights um, to two quite large questions, uh, but, but definitely gave us um, some really, really valuable insights in that sense. Um, all right, so I will very quickly um, ask each of our panelists uh, to answer a very short question from my side and in terms of uh, forward looking, and then I'll go back to uh, some of the questions that we have in the chat. We have quite a few uh, coming in, which is great. Um, but just uh, starting with Kate and then on to Rulof and then on to Nilmini, um, you know, if you could give us in, in just a couple of minutes, uh, your impression of what you think is the most important uh, sort of open frontier or new question to understand in this research and policy space, uh, or and or what you're excited to explore in your own work going forward. Uh, so Kate, we'll start with you. I mean, I, I think if, if we're very honest with ourselves, um, you know, I think a lot of the researchers working in this space have been, um, you know, we've just been starting out um, careers with, you know, maybe less pull with, with government and, and other policy players. And I think the kind of work that we've been doing has been, um, you know, stuff that it's possible to do in, in collaboration with NGOs. Um, I think with, you know, Rulof and their team, I had huge admiration for the fact that they were already managing to get to work with the Department of Labor. Um, but even then, you know, it's not been stuff that has been politically difficult or, or controversial. 
Um, you know, it's been sort of smaller information type interventions. I think we've all been surprised at how big the effects of some of these things have been, um, you know, compared to the effects that they've had in, in other countries. So I think, you know, the limited information has been more of a problem than we anticipated. And we have kind of struck it lucky with what we've managed to do with those sorts of interventions. But I think we need to go a little bit back to the sort of older, older toolkits of um, things that have been, been used by governments in developed countries. And as we start to have more ability to expand the social safety net and social protection, you know, as government is, is putting more political energy into this space, I think thinking about things that can really, you know, have, have large scale effects potentially if they're done well. So things like, um, vocational training programs, um, potentially different kinds of wage subsidy or, or tax incentives, um, you know, potentially thinking about how um, firms deal with, with labor market regulation, those really big levers, which are harder to do experiments on, but really important. You know, I think ambitiously, that's probably where we, we need to go. The one other thing, you know, there's is probably cash transfers and, um, uh, you know, job seekers type allowances. So for me, that's, you know, that's where we, we need to be moving. I think it's very challenging in the South African space because it's, um, you know, it's requiring interventions that are, that are more expensive, but potentially have higher potential. Um, you know, so you, we really need to be thinking about working with, with government a bit more. And although, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of willingness that can be slower and more, more difficult to move, and there can be more controversies about randomizing and, and um, doing pilots. But I think there's also been an encouraging sense that, you know, we need to start piloting things or, or testing different kinds of, of variations. And I think that's that's a really good thing. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's an enormous amount to be done. And although COVID has been very difficult, I think it has given government a lot of the political will to to test more and, and adapt more in the space. Um, so I think it's it's going to be really exciting to continue to work with all of these partners going forward and also looking forward to seeing the work um, normally and, and uh, Rilof and others are, are doing in this space. Excellent. Um, thank you so much. Um, Rilof, uh, I know you spoke to us a little bit about uh, some of the pilot work you're doing around uh, internet based opportunities. So if you'd like to um, chat a little bit more about that, that's great. But I also have a question here for you from uh, Jocelyn Vass. Um, who says that uh, although this might be a slightly old question, um, but she asks what what do you think the ethical issues of conduct of conducting excuse me experimental research in a country with such high unemployment rates uh, for young people are? Yeah, uh, so thanks, Jocelyn. I think that's an important question and one that that uh, people like myself and I'm sure Kate and Nilmani uh, spend hours uh, worrying about and debating and. and uh, submitting ethics applications to make sure that there's no that there's no sizable risk. So, um, so, so I think the first thing to say is, in order to do any of these uh, projects, we need to get ethical approval from all of the various institutions that we're affiliated with, right? So, uh, so usually, as you saw from from Kate's study as well, usually there are three or four researchers involved. They're based at universities across the world. Uh, you know, often the World Bank is involved, often JPL is involved. So, so whatever we do. Has to abide by the by the ethical standards of all of those bodies, and usually what's required is that we that we think carefully about all the potential risks to participants, and then we need to demonstrate uh, firstly that the that the risks aren't going to be sizable, uh, and then secondly that if there if there's any risk whatsoever that the risk uh, we've got to demonstrate that the expected benefit uh, definitely exceeds the, the the expected costs, right? Much like like an ethics approval for for a new drug trial. Um, so, so certainly in the, in the projects that I've been involved with, we spend a lot of time thinking about all these different, the different things that can go wrong and how to, how to minimize that. We also uh, usually pay all the participants for being involved in the study. Uh, so, so I think based on all that, I, I don't think that uh, in any of the studies that I've been involved with, that there were really participants who regretted being involved or who felt are done by. Um, I think it's I think it's trickier once you start doing health research uh, or education research with a with a with a um, the 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 population that you're focusing on is more is more vulnerable. But um, yeah, it's certainly something that we that we worry about a lot and we pay we we pay a lot of attention to. Great, thank you for that. Um, and then Nilmini, uh, just to ask you, uh, you know, in terms of uh, open frontiers and new questions that you're interested in 
uh, or what you're excited to explore, <laughs> excited to explore in your own work going forward. Yeah, um, definitely. So, I mean, I actually, I really um, agree with Kate. I think we, um, I think it's been exciting to see that these, um, that, you know, these, these sort of, you know, quite low cost um, kind of information provision uh, interventions have been, have been so successful. Um, but for, especially given, you know, considering their cost, but I do think we need to get back to thinking about some of the harder um, questions like how to stimulate labor, more, much more labor demand, and also how to improve the, the supply of skilled workers and really making sure we're getting people, um, you know, getting all our, our young people the right, um, the, the right uh, skills and attributes to succeed in the labor market. I think that goes beyond just um, giving them uh, education, though that's in incredibly important, but also teaching them how to how to navigate the labor market. Um, um, and and something I'm personally excited for is to um, explore the role that that um, that social networks play in in that. So we we see in South Africa that um, some you know one person's social network is very different to another's right it's in South Africa so it's everything's very very different but um and the kind of information people have the kind of examples they have in their life of, of people in jobs of um what work looks like what where you know how how to find work etc just very different person to person um and a lot of that information is something that's transmitted through, through social networks so I think uh, I'm I'm personally very excited to start exploring um, things that can be done about that. Maybe ways to link link people with with different um, with other people that they wouldn't have met before, and um, see what could come of uh, of those kind of interventions that that might help um, boost uh, different kinds of attributes and skills um, than just education alone. Great, thank you uh, for that answer, Nomini. Um, so I'm cognizant of time and we have about seven minutes uh, left in the session. So I'm gonna ask uh, one more question uh, to each panelist. Um, and these are all from the uh, open chat questions. Um, and so to Nilmini, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask a question from uh, Jocelyn Bass as well, um, at where she asks you if you've unpacked the issue of attitude uh, being the problem ex uh, experienced by, by employers. Uh, often this may be that employers want youth to be submissive and alternatively, it could also mean learning propensity. So just your, your sort of thoughts on that. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, I don't know the answer, but I think it's really important for us to further explore this because I think it has very different implications one way or another, right? If, um, um, you know, and, and on the one hand, it may be um, that the right intervention is something you could deliver on the youth side something that helps sort of prepare them for or, or orientate them towards towards um, uh, more of a learning mindset or something that's something I'm actually formally testing right now so watch this space um, um, but you know in, in another case it could be actually that the right that you know we need to be supporting actually our our, our um, employers um, uh, to be able to kind of accommodate the different kinds of youth um, that that they're they're having to now at, as this labour market sort of transitions. Um, so yeah, really important question. I wish I had an answer, but I, I promise you, I'm working on it. Um, yeah, and, and keep keep uh, keep watching out for our research. Great, thank you for that, um, and thank you to Jocelyn for the question. Um, so to both Kate and Rulof, um, I have a question here from uh, Isan Basia. Um, he says, thank you both for your excellent presentations and your amazing papers. Um, and so related to the scalability uh, issue, both of your papers uh, provide some suggestive evidence that these effects on uh, job finding uh, or uh, increasing net employment versus jumping up the queue, uh, which is uh, an issue uh, with, my, with interpreting micro effects on search and markets uh, with search frictions. So could you both speak to uh, or speak more about uh, how we should, how much we should be thinking about reducing uh, job search frictions uh, in terms of, of also reducing the net unemployment, unemployment problem? So we can start with uh, Kate and then uh, rule off your thoughts after. Yeah, isn't, I mean, it's, it's a really good question. We've got a whole discussion section, which is put in the part of the paper where you're like, well, I can't really say anything definitive, but I know this is super important. 
Um, so, I mean, that we go a little bit back to the model. I think it depends a little bit, um, you know, is are we actually achieving an improvement in, in match quality um, or a reduction in screening costs for employers? If we do manage that, then, you know, there is some theory that suggests that you might actually get an increase in, um, in total employment rather than just moving people up and down the queue. Um, so, you know, we're only able really to appeal to the model when we, we talk about that. We aren't actually able to test it. I mean, I think there's, you know, there has been amazing work done in, in France, actually looking at the level of the whole labor market, working with the government and the online um, uh, sort of uh, labor market platforms. And, you know, that's the sort of scale that you need to, to answer those kinds of questions with a randomized trial. I mean, the other thing one can start to do is put together the, the trial evidence with um, the sort of work that, that Saldrew's been really pioneering and doing with, with longitudinal data sets. Um, so both with NIDS and uh, NIDS CRAM and then um, other, you know, LF, the QL, LFS and other things. Um, and so I think that sort of intersection of micro and macro work is, is we're, we're hoping to do some, some more work in this, this space with the long-term follow-up of our, um, of our study and, um, uh, you know, also looking at administrative data. So I think those methodological mi mixes are a, a really important um, thing and we're looking forward to getting a little bit more into, into that space. Um, thanks, Isan. I think that's a really interesting question and one that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. So so the two things in our study that that sort of speak to that is that we, we we, we test for a negative externality of a reference data and find no effect, but, the, but the, the standard areas are obviously large and it's not really the right experiment for that. The second thing that I quickly alluded to is that, that we do some, we do gather some objective measures of numeracy and literacy, and it seems like employers are better able to find those individuals through the reference data that doesn't contain any information on the test that we did. And if we think that the thing that employers are really after uh, are these soft skills like reliability, then presumably the, the 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 improvement in match quality could be even greater because because from a from a typical application you know there's even less information about soft skills than about numeracy and literacy so so I think from that perspective I'm optimistic that they I, I think there would be a net employment effect I also speak to South African employers all the time who, who, who lament the fact that they can't you know they they have vacancies but they don't think they can fill it with the right people so they leave, so they leave it unfold I think there are probably business opportunities that go unexploited because uh, because uh, businesses aren't sure or potential businesses aren't sure they can find the right people to 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 make a go of it. So from that perspective, I, I think there could be a, a, a kind of it's not just shuffling around job seekers. I do think it can, it can increase uh, employment. I mean, if I'm if I'm brutally honest, my my knee jerk has always been that we we're, we're not talking about a double digit decrease in, in unemployment, right? I think I think the structural it's, these issues are these these interventions are really cheap cheap and they can work quickly, but they're not going to solve structural issues. But then, having said that, I think the South African labour market is so terribly congested and and ineffective that I think maybe there could be some general equilibrium effect where we switch from using almost uh, exclusively social networks and the small pool of people that that reside in those social networks to to you know if this if information is available in the, in this in this impersonal market process maybe that has a larger effect than 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 i anticipate great thank you for that um and amazingly we seem to be uh, right on time um which is great doesn't usually happen with these uh with these conversations especially one as rich as this, um, and that has prompted uh, so many questions. Um, so I, again, have the distinct pleasure of wrapping up uh, our conversation today and just saying thank you so much to, uh, to Kate Orkin, to Rulof Berger, and to Nilmini Herath for uh, sharing their time with us this afternoon um, for a really great uh, and incredibly informative conversation. Um, I also want to say thank you to uh, Soldru, who uh, helped uh, co-host uh, this event, and I'm sure some of you would have seen their, uh, the invite for this event through their mailing list. Um, so thank you for their support. Um, and also just a thank you to uh, Lauren Roeder, who in the background has been uh, working at uh, quite a few of the technical <laughs> and sort of logistical issues uh, in today's conversation. Um, so as I'd mentioned, uh, today's conversation was recorded and it will be made available um, early next year. Um, and you know, please uh, stay in touch with us and uh, follow us on uh, on Twitter, 
um, as well as on our website. Um, and like Normandy said, to look out for more uh, amazing research coming out of uh, JPAL Africa studies, as well as the amazing work being done by uh, JPAL's affiliates. Thank you all very much and have a good afternoon. <laughs>